A couple of a quick announcements as we are uh, just, uh, people are coming in to get their seats. Um, one, in your bulletin there is a insert that I hope that you'll take a look at. And uh, before the Supreme Court is one of the most important decisions of my lifetime, and that is there is a real good chance for the court to turn back the Roe versus Wade decision, which over the last uh, 50 years has resulted in 62 million plus babies being killed in the womb. You wonder why we, in my estimation, why we have the president we have and why our country is under judgment is because God will not ignore that. God will not let America pass when we are killing the unborn. And so this decision has a chance of turning that back. Probably if it goes through as we hoped it, uh, will end can you imagine ending the legalization of killing babies in the womb? And I, I want you to know, um, <clears throat> I hope that you will pray fervently between now and June when the decision is revealed that uh, God would do that very thing. And I'll tell you what I think will happen if it doesn't. But... Um, Second, uh, baptism is an important decision. Many of you are new to Christianity, new to the Lord, and the very first thing God wants you to do as your coming out party is to get baptized. And uh, so <clears throat> we're going to baptize right here on the floor. We set up a, like a hot tub, man. You'll love it, but um, you need to do that, and I hope that you won't put it off, that you'll take that step. It's an important step. You can sign up at the kiosk for that. And then third, beginning in January, about the middle of January, I'm going to teach a six-week leadership class. And um, anybody can attend, but I'm going after, in particular, uh, one of the classes, all the college and high school juniors and seniors, to be a part of this leadership class. I want them to learn what it means to lead. And uh, so we're going to do that in January, about the middle of January. We'll have two classes, one on Wednesday morning early and one on Saturday morning about 10 o'clock. So there will be no excuses. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> all right, you can uh, take your Bibles if you will. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, heroic faith, choose to live by heroic faith, part three. And we're going to talk about Enoch today. Today I want to show you what it looks like to walk with God and um, <clears throat> to understand that the disciples actually walked physically with him. Is that possible for us? Is it really possible for us to experience a walk with God? And maybe more importantly, <clears throat> why? Why should you want to have that walk with him? Well, I'll try to answer that question before we're done. The Bible does not devote a lot of time and space to Enoch, his life. There's really just three places in the Bible he's found. There's more said really in the New Testament, the Old Testament, uh, in Genesis, in Hebrews, and then in the little book <coughs> of Jude, uh, he's spoken of. Now, <coughs> we're going to start in Genesis chapter 5, and in this passage of Scripture, really this chapter, there's about 1,500 years covered, and one of the things you'll notice when you read Genesis 5 is that people died. It says he names the person, tells you how long he lived, and then it says, and he died, and he died, and he died. And um, that's going to be true in you and me. We're going to live, and we're going to die. But there was an exception to that in the life of Enoch. Now, the Bible says that Enoch did not die, that God took him. And he took him for a particular reason, not because he was famous, not because he built an ark or built a city, but he had a testimony of walking with God. And so God said one day, why don't you just come to heaven? Well, <clears throat> he um, um, was a guy that lived during a time and um, when I show you this passage of Scripture, some of you are going to immediately pick up on something that it says. In Genesis 5, beginning in verse 18, it says, When Jared was 162 years old, he became the father of Enoch. 
after the birth of Enoch, Jared lived another 800 years. And he had other sons and daughters. And Jared lived 962 years, and then he died. Now, I remember discipling a new convert, this young man. Um, he, uh, he came to me one of the sessions and said, Babe, before we get started, i got to ask a question. What is this deal in Genesis? I started reading Genesis, and I'm like, these dudes are living for hundreds of years. He said, Dad, he said Pastor, he said, how is that possible? And, uh, well, how is that possible? Well, um, where is Mike? Right there. <clears throat> so Mike has a class on Tuesdays, and for a further explanation of why people live for hundreds of years, you need to go to that class, and he'll explain this to you. But let me give you three reasons why. One, <clears throat> God designed our bodies to live a thousand years. During the millennial reign, people in mortal bodies will live an entire thousand years. So you have a body that was designed and wired by God to live that long. Second, there was a canopy over the earth before the flood that produced an environment, a kind of a climate that was very seducive to long health and, and long life. And then third, there was no disease as we know it today. And the people did not get sick, and uh, there was no COVID. And uh, so <clears throat> they, uh, they lived long lives. And, uh, and so that uh, gives you an idea. But you can imagine uh, being 162 years, and people say, oh, you're just a punk kid and uh, just getting started. Well, <clears throat> Enoch's walk with God was during a very, very difficult time. It was not easy for someone to walk with God. And I'll explain this even more next week. Before the flood, the entire world, if you will, was baptized in evil. There was extreme violence, sexual practices. It was rampant during the time. And so it was difficult to walk with God. In verse 22, he says this. Um, Let's see, and Enoch was 65 years old, and you know, 60, 365 years. Let me, go, uh, let me go back one verse. So he started his walk, and it says, I think I want verse 23. I'm not sure where that is. Oh, right here. <clears throat> so um, let me find it. Hang on. Aha. So Enoch was 65 years old. He became the father of Methuselah. It's a weird name, isn't it? Why would you name your kid that? Uh, after the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived, here it is, in close fellowship with God. Uh, some translations will say he walked with God for another 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters, and he lived for 365 years. So Enoch started his walk, it seems like, after he was 65, when he had Methuselah. And uh, something changed. And sometimes, even in young couples' lives, uh, they get married, they don't go to church anywhere, and then they have that first child, and they begin thinking, you know, maybe we should start going to church and give them some church experience. And, and they try to find a church. I would say that's a wonderful reason to come to church, but I want you to know God wants the whole family to come to church. He wants your kids growing up saying, my dad and my mom went to church faithfully and taught us that the Bible is true and was a part of our life. And so he walked with God and began his fellowship in a close way after the age of 65 and did that for 300 years. Now, he was not only a guy that walked with God, but he was a preacher, the Bible says. In Jude, it says Enoch was the seventh from Adam and preached, that's what the word means, prophesied uh, about these men. Also saying, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sin sinners have spoken against him. 
So the Bible says that he came to preach against ungodliness, and he was the guy that was going to preach and warn about judgment to come. Now, the universal people have a hard time with the whole flood thing and all the language about God's judgment during the flood because they preach that everybody's going to heaven. And yet God makes a distinction, especially here, about the fact that there were people that he was going to bring judgment upon who lived ungodly. Now, <clears throat> when you uh, study the, the name Methuselah, he, li- he was the oldest guy in the Bible. 969 years. Think about that. So he lived for 969 years. Why did he get the name Methuselah? I believe it was because God gave Enoch a revelation that at the end of your son's life, judgment is going to come. And that's why his name means when he is dead, it will be sent forth. In other words, he's going to live, and however long he lives, when he dies, judgment's coming. And if you do the math, you'll find that when the year he died is when the flood came. You can imagine having a son who you've been told, as long as he's alive, no judgment. Whenever he dies, I'm judging the world. You'd you'd really want to protect him, right? I mean, where are you going, son? Big John's going with you, and, um, and we're just going to, I think the neighbors probably helped out. Let's keep him healthy, give him everything he can, keep him well, because we don't want judgment to come. Well, the most interesting thing about Enoch was that he did not die, and that's what our text says. Hebrews 11.5 says, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found Because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. He pleased God. And uh, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. One day, family was driving home from church. Parents asked their children an important question that you should ask your kids every Sunday on the way home. That is, what did you learn in church today, in junior church? And right now, while we're doing this, all the kids are also studying the Bible. And by the way, we need your help. If uh, Not if, but all of you should pray about being a part of teaching children and being a part of their life. We're looking for people that are committed to helping children learn the Bible, and I hope that you'll help us do that. But... Um, on the way home, the parents said, well, what did you learn? And uh, the kids said, <clears throat> well, we learned about Enoch, that he walked with God for 300 years, and one day when he was walking with God, it got late, and Enoch said, it's, it's getting late, and I, I better turn around and go home. And God said, well, you know, you're closer to my home than your home. Why don't you just walk with me? And, uh, and so they said, Enoch's been walking with God ever since, Dad. <laughs> I like that. And uh, so I want you to know <clears throat> Enoch is a picture of what may happen in our generation, and that is the rapture. God just took him up to heaven. He raptured him up to heaven, and that could happen in our generation. He uh, was a picture of what we're looking forward to in the second coming of Christ. The Bible says in two passages, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, listen, listen. I tell you a mystery. The word mystery means something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, now revealed today. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. How fast? In a flash, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable or incorruptible and we will be changed. So Paul said there's coming a time when if you're alive during this time, there's going to be an instant change and you're going to go to heaven. He speaks of it in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. He says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven. There's two parts of the second coming. He comes in the clouds during the rapture and calls all of us home. And then he comes seven years later back to the earth uh, to rule and reign. It says that 
with, um, with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel. And there's that trumpet with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Why didn't he just say the dead will rise first? Because the only people that he's calling to heaven in a resurrected body are the dead in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you can't go to heaven. So it doesn't make sense that they would say everybody's going to heaven if you have to be in Christ. And that is a decision that you make when you invite Christ in your life. So the dead are in heaven in spirit. They're going to receive their resurrected body, will rise first. After that, we, Paul said, who are still alive and left will be, and there's where we get the word raptured, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So God says, just like Enoch was one day taken, one day God's coming back and going to rapture everybody in a moment. Just think of that happened this morning. All of a sudden, bam, everybody's gone except you. And you look around and go, what happened? What happened was the rapture took place and you were left. And so I hope that you are not left. I hope that you invite Christ into your life and know that if the rapture takes place, you're going to be a part of that. Now, as I thought about Enoch and walking with God, I thought about how to describe this. And really, there are three positions in walking with God. Let me answer the question, why should you want to walk with him? The Bible says, if you walk with God, you will be greatly blessed. You will have things in your life that you could never have. And it uh, maybe is described a little bit in John 10.10. 10. A thief's purpose, a devil's purpose is really to steal, to kill, and destroy you. Everything he wants to do that's bad in your life is wrapped up in one of those three words. He wants to take from you. He wants to punish you. He wants to destroy relationships in your life. But Jesus said, my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. Rich does not mean rich financially. Rich means a full life, a meaningful life, a life with purpose, a life that everybody really is looking for. So he said, if you walk with me, that's the kind of life you'll have. Now, <clears throat> the question comes to mind, how do you know how close you're walking with the Lord? Well, first, you have to begin walking with him by inviting him into your life. And then as you live your Christian life, how close is your walk? Let me ask you this morning, how close is your walk? How close are you walking with him in your, uh, in your daily life? And how do you determine <coughs> how close that walk is? Well, let me show you three positions. Number one, you can walk with him. And that's what he desires, even if you are a young person. Uh, an elementary age or teenager, God wants to walk with you. Jesus wants to walk with you. But uh, he wants you to walk with him. Have you noticed that walking with somebody is different in what you can do in fellowship? When you're walking with somebody, it's easy, isn't it, to talk to them, to pour out your heart to them, uh, to share the things that are important, to ask good questions, to observe things together, to laugh together. You can't do that if you're out running with somebody. You can't do that if you're even in the gym working out together. But you can do that when you're walking with him. God wants to walk with you so he's close enough to talk to you. And um, so that's the goal, is to have the Lord walk with us each day in close fellowship. Well, there's a, another position that is walking in front of him. I've experienced this more times than I want to tell. But uh, walking in front of him is not that you're not walking, that you're not walking in fellowship. It's just that you get tired of waiting for the Lord. And, and God, you're walking along and, and you see things and you go, ah, well, that's what we need to be doing. And that's what I need to go after that. And I jump out in front of the Lord and say, this is a good idea, Lord. You need to follow me here. Now, David, King David, experienced this. David one day called Nathan the prophet before him and said, man, do I have a great idea. 
You know, God's living in that tabernacle, that tent. I think we should build him a solid structure. He deserves that. And Nathan the prophet said, that is awesome, David. Go for it. And sounded like a good idea to him. Until he went home that night and God spoke to the prophet and said, oh, I never told you to say that. And you go back and tell David, that's not what I want him to do. Solomon, his son's going to do that, not him. Good idea, wrong time, wrong place, as far as the person involved. And so you can get in front of God by thinking, you know God, you know God's will for your life better. It, it, it's, we just hate waiting on the Lord, don't you? Uh, you know, I've waited a week. I, I think that's, that's long enough. And so... Uh, most of the time when we jump ahead, we end up with uh, consequences. Now, there's a second or third position that's just walking behind him. And uh, most of us give testimony of what that is like. When God said, I want you to walk with me, and you go, no, I don't want to do that. I'm okay with walking with you on these things, but that, no, I'm not going to do that. And any time you say no, and I don't want to walk with him, then you're walking behind him. And the problem is, if he's a little bit out in front of you, the more that you say no to his will, the more distance there is between you and him. And we call that backsliding sometimes, being out of fellowship with the Lord. You can get to the place where he is way, way away. And you can hardly remember a time when you walked with him. So, God wants us to know that he wants to walk with us. We can be out in front. We can be behind. But they, I hope that today there's a fourth. I don't have time to go into. But you can walk away from him. Maybe you've known people or talked to people who said, Oh, I used to go to church and I, I, I heard the gospel and I know all about the Jesus thing. I just don't want anything to do with that. And they walk away from him. So... <clears throat> All of these positions with Jesus is also true of a marriage. God wants you to walk together. He wants you to be in fellowship. He wants you to laugh together and cry together, pray together, be close enough that you can hear each other. It's possible to get out in front of your spouse and say, Hey, come on, woman, follow me. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't work real well, I can tell you that. I can give testimony to that. And then, <clears throat> um, so you can be out and then you can get behind your spouse right doing things that you shouldn't be doing in a way that really hurts the relationship so you can get out in front and behind and God wants you to know how important it is to walk with the Lord as well as walk in your uh, in your marriage together now so far in our study <clears throat> we have um, we have studied that faith is not an emotion right Faith is not a tingle. Faith is not something that when you start walking with Jesus, all of a sudden, whoo, you feel that blue flame go down your spine, and you know you have it. Now I know I'm walking with Jesus. What if that was true? And uh, people would just tell the weirdest stories, wouldn't they? Uh, weirdest emotional stories about walking with God. Uh, if you hear somebody use that kind of language about walking with God and describe it as some kind of an emotional experience, you need to walk away from them. And uh, because the Bible never hints at that. God says that faith is what we do, not say or feel. It is an action, just like we are to do things by faith. So, I mean, honestly, if I said to you this morning, how many of you, you're here, but this morning when you woke up, oh boy, I don't know if I'm going to go. I know I should go. I don't want, there's other things we get. Ah, and there was a tug of war. You came, but it wasn't because you had, you know, a blue flame down your spine saying, woohoo, can't wait to go to church. So <clears throat> I, I want you to know, we do things because it's the right thing to do. Now, emotions come after we're obedient. After we do the right things, we feel really good about it. And so God wants us to know that faith <clears throat> is not something that we feel, is something we do because God said it. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. The word please him 
is the same thing as walk with him. If you're pleasing the Lord, you're walking with him. They're synonymous. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder. So God said, if you walk with me, you're going to be blessed. I'm going to reward you in ways you could never imagine. And God wants us to know that our walk is based upon a substance. Verse 1 of the chapter says we walk based upon a substance. The substance of our faith is the word of God. So we're not just blindly walking like people say, well, you, your Christians are just a... You just jump out there and, and believe in believing. No, we don't. We believe in the evidence of the Word of God. And uh, there is no book that even comes close. And so I want you to know our faith is resting upon something that cannot be refuted. We've given you a definition, and that is <clears throat> faith is, um, I said pleasing God is the same as walking with God. Faith is acting like God is telling you the truth, right? It is reading something and believing that to the point you go, I'm going to do that because God doesn't lie. What God said is true. I'm going to do what he said, even though it may be hard. So God wants me to walk by faith. Last week we looked at the fact that faith always begins with worship. And we worship God by faith. We worship one God who has revealed himself in Scripture, and we worship one way, according to his, his um, prescription. We saw that in John chapter 4, verse 27. You must worship by, he said, in spirit and in truth, in the sincerity of your heart and according to the word of God. And so that's the only f- worship that God says he recognizes. God said, I want your best. I don't want leftovers. Your leftover time, your leftover energy, your leftover resources. I want you to give me your best. He gave his best, and he wants our best. Today, I want you uh, to. I want to show you that heroic faith uh, is always seen as to where it is walking. Where is your faith leading you today? In Micah chapter six and verse eight, it says, "He has shown you, O mortal, or O." Man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? What a great question. What does God want of us? To act justly and to love mercy. There's that balance that I've always talked about. The fact that God says, I want you to love and I want you to know the truth. I want you to live the truth, but I want you to live it in love. That's not an easy balance. And he speaks of it here. Just and mercy and walk humbly with your God. So God wants us to know that this faith walk is something that we do um, as God leads us according to Scripture. Now, walking with Jesus requires you to walk away from some things. Now, some of you that are new are probably sitting there thinking, Aha! I was just waiting for it. Here we go. Now you're going to tell us all the things we can't do because we're Christians. We can't, you know... Can't drink and smoke and chew or go with girls that do. And uh, so so I I want you to know, God, there's a lot of things God makes clear in Scripture not to do. And then God gives us the Holy Spirit to lead us in those gray areas. But I, I want you to know that walking with the Lord is a privilege. And if you understand the benefits of walking with the Lord then the give up becomes a lot easier. Uh, for instance, uh, if I said to you, hey, want to play, uh, play football for the Grizz, maybe you some young guys, and they go, man, yeah, I'd, that'd be awesome. Well, do you know that if you play football for the Grizz, that's a position of honor, there is a whole different life requirement for those students than any other students. There's a lot of things they cannot do if they're on that team. It becomes even worse if you're on the NFL team. They own you, and they tell you where you can go and what you can't do. And so if you want this position of honor, there are certain things you have to say no to. You know, that's true with a bank president or with a a police officer, position of honor. There are certain things now you cannot do that other people could do. 
But in order to have this position of honor, you have to be willing to discipline yourself and do some things in the area of responsibility that other people may not do. Well, <clears throat> wouldn't that be easy if you, someone said, hey, you want to walk with the king of kings, the one who spoke the world into existence? You want to walk with him? Yeah. Would you be willing to give up these things? Yeah. When I see what's available to me in this position of honor, I should be willing to exchange the things that he says are really not good for your life anyway. So, <clears throat> God wants me to know that letting go of certain things that are a distraction in my life are important if I want to have fellowship with the Lord. If a Jill said to me, hey, honey, let's, let's take a walk and uh, let's go on a walk. Now, hey, by the way, guys, when your wife says, let's go on a walk, it's not because she's looking for exercise. She wants time alone with you. And uh, so if you start your walk with her and you pull out your phone, go, you know, you don't mind. Huh? This is a good time for me to catch up on my uh, text messages and emails and and uh, we'll just walk and I'll I'll do this. How do you think she would react to that? Not good. And that's not the purpose of the walk. And, you know, there's a lot of things that I have to be willing to recognize that if I'm going to walk with the Lord, there are things that I have to be willing to cut loose. Um, habits that are sinful, habits that are destructive, relationships that are not healthy. If I'm going to walk with him and walk continually, there are some things that I have to say no to. Here's one of them. <clears throat> the Bible said, Blessed is the one who does not walk, and then he tells us who not to walk with. Don't walk in the steps with the wicked. So there's walking with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners. Now we've gone from walking to standing or to sit in the company of mockers. See the progression? Now you're hugging each other. And God said, if you start walking with people that are unhealthy for you and your walk of, with the Lord and really in life, it won't help you. If you want to be blessed, Learn who to hang out with. He said, or sit in the company of mockers. But here's that. Here's this person. But uh, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, in the word of God. And who meditates, thinks about, reads, studies uh, the word day and night. That person will be like a tree planted by the streams of water which constantly, really, is yielding its fruit in the season and whose leaf does not wither and watch. Whatever they do, prosper. Man, I like that. God says, I'm going to bless you and whatever you choose to do because you're walking with me. But you have to say no to some people that uh, are not healthy for your life. Now, <clears throat> most of us understand that it's not God's choice for us to do things and be with people that are not helpful. And yet, most of the time, when we think about God walking with us, we are saying, God, I want you to walk with me. Matter of fact, I want you to bless me. Come walk, bless me, join me. And God says, no, oh, it doesn't work that way. If you're going to walk with me, you have to come where I'm at and walk with me. And so God wants us to know that he says in Amos 3.3, 3, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, uh, walking with the Lord will change you. It'll change your life. It won't be long before people will see a difference in you. It'll change how you talk and how you react. It'll change how you love people. And um, people will see a difference about the things that are really important in your life. When the disciples were called before the government leaders for preaching, they said this about them. Now when they, that's the leadership of the town, the religious leaders, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. All the disciples were blue-collar guys. They marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. When you hang out with Jesus, when you walk with Jesus, things change, and your life changes. 
and your marriage will change. God will make you better in every way if you start walking with him. So God wants us to know that there are benefits. Walking with Jesus is the same as walking in the Spirit. When people say, I'm, I'm trying to walk in the Spirit, well, it's the same as walking with Jesus or pleasing Jesus. And um, Galatians 5 talks about this. Now, if, if it was easy to walk in the Spirit or walk with Jesus, I wouldn't be really preaching on this. But it takes discipline to walk with the Lord. Watch. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So here's what's true with everybody sitting here this morning. God says, you have an old nature. Just because the Spirit of God came into your life when you got saved doesn't mean your old nature left. It's still there, and it's still trying to get you to do the things that it wants to do. And the Spirit of God is saying, no, 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 don't do that. Get up. Go to church, you lazy bum. Get out of bed. And uh, so there's this contest for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want but if you are led by the spirit you're not under the law so many times young christians feel this tug of war going on and they don't understand why they still want to do uh, the wrong things why they still want to practice old habits and uh, they wonder maybe something's wrong with me maybe this christianity is not working for me i want you to know something everybody has that going on in their life because it's a part of living the christian life the tug of war well he goes on to say here are the things that i don't want you to do the acts of the flesh are obvious Sexual immorality, impurity, which would cover all of the uh, porn stuff that's out there today that's so popular. Debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, which would cover every phase of all of the spiritualism, New Age stuff, uh, Ouija boards and all that stuff is all satanic. Uh, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. Do people know you as somebody that they go, oh, be careful around that person? I mean, one wrong word, <laughs> I mean, they'll blow up on you. That should not be true of you if you're a, a believer. Uh, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He, now watch what he says. I warn you, as I did before, that those who... Live like this. It means that is your habit of life. That is your lifestyle. It's not like you got drunk once or you did one of these things once. No, no. He's saying people who live this way, that is their life, he goes on to say, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So this idea that everyone goes to heaven is so contrary to the whole teaching of the Bible. So God said, if you live, if that is your lifestyle, that's your addiction, and that's what is driving you, you're not headed for heaven. Now, I asked you earlier, how do you determine how close your walk is to the Lord? How close? How many of you remember when you could drive a car and you did not have to wear a seatbelt? Remember that? Yeah. Some of the older people. Now, <clears throat> wearing a seatbelt is a man-made law. You're not more spiritual because you wear a seatbelt. I understand it's a law, and it's what we're supposed to do, and it, you know, it saves lives, all that. I, I just don't like wearing them. I can tell you that. I just don't. And you say, Pastor, you wear a seatbelt? Not if I can help it. I don't. And uh, I only wear it with people that go, Pastor, you're not wearing a seatbelt. Okay, okay. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I remember a time when when the cars all had a, a flat seat in front, there wasn't a console, and there was just a bench seat. So when you were behind somebody, a couple, and the guy was driving, you could tell if it was a relationship that was exciting because she would be sitting almost on his lap. 
and her arm would be around him, and her head would be on his shoulder. You could hardly see if there was two people there. And, uh, <clears throat> and you go, yeah, boy, there you go. And, uh, and at stoplights, I mean, sometimes you go, good night. I mean, they need to k- k- wait, get a room or something, right? So, uh, so <clears throat> but you could also tell when there was a couple in the car, and he was driving, and she was hugging the passenger door. That they weren't a couple and they weren't close. Closeness is determined by proximity, right? How close you are. I want you to know something. Jesus wants you to choose to be close to him every day by your decision to worship him. He's not looking for visitation rights. He wants full custody of your life. He's not looking for a weekly visitation when you come to church. He wants you to walk with him all the time. Now, walking with the Lord. <clears throat> um, and by the way, here are the fruits of the Spirit. I, I mean, show you the positive, right? So the reason you should walk with the Lord is because these things will become evident in your life. Love, joy, peace. Man, if that was just those three, it would be worth it. But forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of those things are all things we want in our life. God says, if you walk with me, that becomes the character of your life. So, <clears throat> walking requires practice. Practice. Have you noticed that when kids start walking, it's fun to watch them. Their, their legs are wobbly, and they, and they fall down, and they get back up, and they do it again. And, and it, it has to, it, there's a practice. And you know, uh, if you want to learn to shoot a gun, I have found uh, that you just don't go shoot a gun if you want to do it right. You need somebody to help you learn how to do that. It's like going to play golf. It's not something you do without practice. And people have found that if you really want to learn some skill, you go find somebody that's really good at that, and help, they'll help you. That's why people hire hunting guides and fishing guides because they can get right to the place and learn how to do it right. So God wants you to know that the best way to learn a new habit is to have somebody in your life that's helping you. Um, I lived also before GPS and uh, my wife and I'd be in the car and uh, I would say to her, how much further before we turn off on I-90 going south. Look at the map. She said, I hate the map. She thought maps were demonic. And uh, she didn't know how to read them. She didn't like them. She'd turn them and try to figure it out. I go, come on, how hard is reading a map? That was, the translation of that was, you're stupid because you can't read a map. And uh, that didn't go over real well. (laughs) And uh, so... When GPS came and we downloaded that on our phone, it saved our marriage. I mean, <laughs> hallelujah. There were no more fights in the car. And we have this voice talking to us, and we just follow the voice, and boom, we're there. We still like GPS. So <clears throat> walking by faith requires practice. It also requires you listening to the right voices, people around you that will help you. One of the ways to do that is through discipleship. It's getting in relationship with someone who's guiding you through a Bible study. Each week, each week. It is going to a life group where you can be around other people who have had those experiences ahead of you that can help you in life. So God wants you to know walking by faith, it takes practice. Enoch walked with God and obeyed him. And when he had a question, he turned to God. When he had a need, he turned to the Lord. When he had a weakness, he asked God for strength. When he had a business problem, he asked the Lord, hey, can you help me solve this? So one of the ways that you can determine how close your walk is with Jesus, when you have a problem come to your life, a crisis, a need, how long does it take you to turn and ask Jesus for help? Do you call everybody else? Do you text everybody else? Do you get frustrated and angry and mad before you finally say, okay, maybe I should pray? 
Or do you right away say, hey, Lord, would you help me with this? I can't figure this out. We're not sure how to do this. God says if you are walking with him, he wants to help you. And I want you to remember, how you live will determine how you leave this life. So walk with him. Now, I've ended each message with a real short leadership lesson. I said from last week, worship gives you two things you need as a leader, humility and confidence. When you confess your sins before the Lord, you get off your knees with confidence that things are right with you and the Lord, and you begin walking. And when you walk with the Lord, one of the things that God gives you is a vision. And if you know anything about leadership, one of the things that leaders say is, what is your vision? What's your vision for tomorrow, for your life, for the next five years? Where are you headed? And what are you seeing in your life right now that can be improved, that can be changed? Leaders are always saying, let's do it better. So, let me ask you a question. If you're walking with the Lord, and you're asking that question, how can I do life better, in what areas are we talking? Well, marriage would be a good one. Some of you, that's right there is all you need. You need to ask the Lord, how can I get my marriage back on track? And if you walk with Jesus, I promise you, he will help you. But you should want that for your children, for your business, for your physical health, but most of all, your spiritual walk. So God said there's a lot of benefits to walking with him. And he wants you to take that outline, and if you'll just take the part that, that I put right there and tape it on your mirror, and between now and 22, would you just begin saying, Lord... How can I improve my life in one of these key areas? How can I be better in 22? Because God wants your walk to improve. And if you're walking with Jesus, things get better. Now, I hope that this morning you'll ask yourself that question. Where is Jesus in relationship to me? I want you to know, if someone moves, it's not him. If you don't feel close to the Lord, it's because you moved. And God wants you to restore that walk so that he can whisper in your ear, hey, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want to help you. And you hear him. It's hard to hear somebody when you're out in front of them or out behind them. You just can't hear them talking like you can when they're beside you. Let's bow our heads in word of prayer. I wonder this morning how many of you are here and you'd say, Pastor, my walk is not where it needs to be. I know that. I'm not walking in fellowship with him. I know the Lord. I'm a Christian, but my walk is not where it ought to be. Maybe you're out in front, but chances are maybe you're in behind because you have chosen I'm just not I don't want to do that so you would say I don't I want to stop that I want my walk to be right and you'd say today would you pray for me pastor that I'll get my walk with Jesus restored to where it needs to be if that's true of you would you raise your hand and say pray for me that's true my life amen a lot of hands God bless you thank you I wonder if you're here and you don't even have a walk. You're not even sure you're a Christian. And you'd say, would you pray for me? I'm not sure Jesus is in my heart. But I want that. I don't want to walk away from him. I want to walk with him. And you'd say, would you pray for me, Pastor? I want Jesus to come into my life today. Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me? That's me. I'm not a Christian, but I want to be someone like that today. God bless you. Thank you. You know, all that God asks is that you say a simple prayer, meaning with all of your heart. Jesus will come into your life if you will just ask him to. And so let me just lead you in a simple salvation prayer. If you're sitting here wanting to make sure that if you died right now, you'd go to heaven, would you just 
say this prayer and make it yours and say it right to God. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I cannot save myself. I ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart and save me and forgive me of all my sins. I give you my life and my will in Jesus' name. Now with our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer and asked Jesus in your heart, would you raise your hand again? Say, I did. I prayed that prayer. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Good. Good. That's wonderful. Our Father in heaven, we thank you <clears throat> for the great privilege of having Jesus. We can read the story. During this Christmas time, he decided to leave heaven and come and walk among us. He showed us what God is like in the flesh. And he walked with the disciples. And the Bible says that he wants to walk with us. So Lord, thank you for the great privilege of being able to walk with the King of Kings every day. And I pray today you would help us to leave here walking closer than we were before. Wanting to stay in fellowship. Knowing that if we do, our life will be so much better in every area. Lord, help us to be sensitive to the people around us that don't know how to find the light. There are so many lost people in the world and they need someone to say, here, let me help you find how Jesus loves you and wants to forgive you of your sins and tell them the greatest story in the world. So bless us as we are a witness for you today and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give a great hand.